Norma Fragoso. I am delighted uh, to be here today to introduce you to our eminent presenters, Bob Battaglio, Christina Toms, and Elizabeth Rush. They will be discussing how building healthy and equitably resilient communities are the best mitigation to rising seas. I won't elaborate further at this time and just go ahead and start introducing them and they can speak for themselves. We will begin today with Robert Bob Battaglio, who is a senior engineer and vice president of Environmental Science Associates and currently sits on the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission. Uh, our panelists full bios are online, you can catch them there. I will just uh, mention that his expertise, among other things, is in coastal geomorphology and nature-based floodplain and environmental restorations. He will also share some interesting information with us about examples of managed and unmanaged retreat. So Bob, if you would like to begin sharing your screen now, please feel free. Um, uh, well, good morning. Uh, yes, my name is Bob Battaglio and actually I'm not on the BCDC Commission. <clears throat> um, I'm uh, on the Engineering Criteria Review Board, which advises the Commission. I'm also on the Design Review Board, which advises the Commission on uh, engineering criteria and design, uh, respectively. Um, so I'm a professional engineer. I'm licensed in uh, California as a civil engineer. My training's in coastal processes. Um, I am, uh, as, as Norma mentioned, and thank you, Norma, for introducing me, a senior engineer with Environmental Science Associates, uh, headquartered out of San Francisco. Although, like everybody, I'm working at home these days. Um, I am also a vice president and I have over 30 years of experience. Um, as a surfer, I've really been interested in uh, the natural environment and the coast. I spend the, well, most of my time um, pretty close to the water, if not in it, as much as I can anyway. So um, if you don't know who Environmental Science Associates is, ESA as we call ourselves, um, provides environmental consulting services, including ecology restoration design and climate adaptation planning and we've been in business for over 50, just over 50 years now. Um, so my talk today is challenging norms, innovative adaptation measures in response to sea level rise. First I want to mention this picture on the screen. I really like this picture because it gives you the perspective of a person walking on the beach and if you follow the footprints um, you'll see that eventually you would reach a blockage so that prevents you from walking further down the beach and that's a coastal armoring structure uh, with a bunch of rocks and then the upper bluff is also armored and you can also see the apartment building or condominium building up on the bluff and of course they have a different perspective they see that armoring is protecting their property So my presentation will cover these topics, managed retreat, vertical accommodation, nature-based natural infrastructure, innovative structures, adaptation zoning, adaptive response. As I understand it, I'm gonna have the floor here. Um, and then if you write your questions down, we'll have an opportunity to answer questions and you know, discuss things further towards the end. Uh, first, uh, managed retreat or unmanaged retreat. These are pictures of Pacifica, where I live. Um, for those of you who uh, aren't local, Pacifica is just south of San Francisco, actually just south of Daly City, um, on the Pacific coast. <clears throat> Picture on the uh, upper left shows a home that was demolished a few years ago. Uh, there were two homes demolished. The other one was, was right next to this one. And there were, I think, seven homes, seven 
yeah, I think it was seven, uh, along this row of the bluff uh, that were demolished after the 1997-98 El Nino. So this is, I guess, an example of unmanaged retreat. The bluff, which is about 80 feet tall here, uh, is eroding due to wave attack, and these homes uh, are being removed, usually on an emergency basis. If you look at the lower left picture, this is a little farther south where those other homes were removed back in 1998-99. And this is a coastal trail purchased um, with state funding and it's eroding now too. And you can see the sign about the hazardous bluffs. Then on the right is uh, looking north. Uh, these, uh, this picture shows what's left of the three big apartment buildings that were demolished. I think a lot of you saw this on the news, and this is just uh, recent. Uh, the gravel is um, material placed by the city who had to pay for the demolition. Uh, and, you know, this is kind of a, a messy process. It's very stressful for everybody when you have to take action under emergency basis and, and the tenants in these rentals um, didn't have anywhere to go. Uh, the city had to go through a lot of difficult actions. There were lawsuits with armoring failures and the like. So when you, a lot of us, when we see this over and over again, we think, well, you know, maybe there's a better way. Maybe what if we planned ahead? What if we uh, uh, thought about this and tried to do this in a more orderly manner? Would it save money? Would it be more efficient? So that's where the managed retreat concept comes up. Now, this slide shows, you know, one kind of description of managed retreat. Actually, managed retreat is kind of an overarching strategy that is basically at like an adaptation pathway, adapting over time to erosion or sea level rise. But the um, definition I have uh, in the upper right is an adaptive response to coastal erosion and sea level rise that is also controversial, especially in areas of high asset density. These um, Schematics show at the top, you know, uh, an example of a typical situation in California where people have developed very close to the water, the bluff and shores eroded to the point where they felt like they had to build uh, armoring. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the, this pile of rocks here would be like what we call a rock revetment or, you know, a seawall or something. Uh, managed retreat would be an adaptive measure where you uh, remove this development and armoring. Um, uh, you know, relocate, if you will, but basically remove and then restore the back part of the beach, allow natural processes to um, take over. You get um, kind of some ecological and aesthetic and other benefits. And then over time, of course, the shore will continue to erode if that's what it, it wants to do. And so you may have to repeat the managed retreat. Um, this slide, I want to make uh, draw an analogy between coastal managed retreat and uh, floodplain with what I think a lot of people are more familiar with, interestingly enough, is a river floodplain. So this will take me a few minutes. This will be my, my most difficult slide, so bear with me here. Um, on the left is a series of images showing the coast, but I'm gonna start on the right with uh, this stack of images showing uh, a river system. This is actually a bunch of uh, images that we developed for the Napa River project, uh, which is underway um, in Napa Valley, and that's why there are these little vineyard um, images here. But on the very top where it has a number one, this looks, this is the kind of a natural floodplain where you have um, a uh, low flow channel and then during high flow the water spreads out over the floodplain and there's a whole system that relates to that. Uh, what people typically do is they try to optimize the land use over time and they build up the natural levees and squeeze the river and then what happens is the, the flow accelerates in the channel because it can't get out of the channel so it, it what we call down cuts it, 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 it erodes the channel. And then as it erodes the, the bottom of the channel, the banks get steeper and then the whole thing starts to widen out and then it tries to restore uh, something like what it was before, but just at a lower elevation. Of course, this kind of causes problems with the expansion of the um, floodplain development. So the reason why I have numbers here is because one is the natural situation, two is where a lot of us find ourselves and then this arrow, which um, skips 
um, you know, a few steps or maybe decades um, is what we call restoration of the floodplain. And it's not a full restoration, but it is a partial restoration where, where you have space, where you can, you provide more space for the, uh, for the hydraulics and the sediment transport and the ecology. And it's actually a more resilient situation in this case in the Napa River. The um, Venters uh, uh, actually donated their property and cooperated with this project, which I think a lot of people like. So over here on the, on the left, I wanna draw an analogy to the coast. So here's this image um, showing a bluff, it could be a dune, and then you see the beach which moves back and forth in the summer, it's wider in the winter and the tides, and so it's a very dynamic situation. So everybody loves the coast and, you know, they say, well, let's get closer to this and build a parking lot or a building or something, and then uh, we put some fill here and we build out on the beach, and <clears throat> because the beach is encroached upon and the waves hit the fill and everything, then they start to armor it, and so this is kind of a situation a lot of us find ourselves in now. So analogous to the river floodplain restoration, the coastal floodplain restoration would be to remove the fill and armor, but maybe even also cut back into the, into the shore and then provide space for the natural processes. Now this seems kind of radical, but I draw the analogy to flood, uh, river floodplain restoration because it's um, actually not that radical if you think about it. Anyway, um, I'll uh, go a little faster now. And this is an example of managed retreat on the coast. Uh, this is Pacifica State Beach. That's on the south end of Pacifica. The cliffs I showed you earlier were the north end. Um, so I live in this town and I worked on this project a long time ago. It was uh, constructed and completed in 2005. The shore used to be out even with this, these two buildings. Some of you may recognize this building in the background as the Taco Bell which is now a cantina, so it's really kind of upgrading. Um, but anyway, uh, this uh, uh, area was restored by removing a bunch of fill, parking, development. These two buildings were left, um, the Taco Bells on piles, private property, um, and this building, which a lot of people see as a restroom and showers, is actually uh, a complex uh, pump station for wastewater and and uh, uh, rainfall runoff, uh, so it was just couldn't be moved. But anyway, this has been in place for quite a while and um, it's been working great. These dunes were restored, it's beautiful. Everybody loves it. Um, another example is Surfers Point Managed Retreat Project in uh, Ventura, California, Southern California. Um, real quickly, this is looking down from above, and um, the project is between this river jetty, the river's right over here, and you can see how this on the right, this um, pavement is pretty bold out towards the beach. It's really, you know, just like a narrow beach and then the pavement. Well, that used to extend along this faint white line that my cursor is going across here. And soon after they filled all this and built this nice bike path, it, it was eroded. So the project is essentially removing all that, rebuilding some access farther back, um, and restoring the dunes, placing cobble and sand to restore the natural physical processes, and then the ecological processes follow. Um, another example is um, South Ocean Beach. Now this is not constructed yet but it's underway and I uh, put down here, if you can get this uh, copy of this presentation afterwards, there's a, bunch, a whole bunch of links, lots of people are involved in this. Um, this uh, image in the upper right shows kind of like a problem statement that was just done 20 years ago, uh, which shows um, that what we have is a lot of infrastructure, a wastewater treatment plant, a zoo, and uh, the Great Highway Extension, and you know, all this was filled and parking lots were built and then it eroded and, and people were, uh, there were several rock revetments built under emergency permits. They're out of compliance with the Coastal Commission. It was really becoming a problem and it is still a problem. But about 20 years ago, a vision was developed where a lot of this would be removed and the roads would be brought back and then the, the shore would be restored uh, to sandy dunes. And, and this is kind of what's happening, although it's going to be more extensive and this road is largely going to be closed. Um, so now, next, vertical retreat. Well, this picture I thought was just interesting. Um, I'm sure it's very alarming to 
people that own property in an eroding area, but this is not vertical retreat. But vertical retreat is an alternative to what we just saw. It's a little proactive, but um, what it amounts to is raising your building above the floods um, vertically. So it's like managed retreat, which is more horizontal, but you can all might go vertical. On uh, the upper right here, we show one of the complications where you build a new structure that's higher, you end up having you know some differences in your architecture and the like. And then this lower left is a uh, aerial image of uh, Stenson Beach. And you can see that there are several buildings on piles, interesting stories here. In the, um, in the upper right, we have, uh, this is an image from FEMA that actually shows how you would design a building for storm surges and floods where you allow the water to inundate occasionally your lower level and you do some flood proofing and the like. And then this really kind of innovative um, ideas, I think it really came out of Northern Europe. I think they've actually done this in some places where they have buildings in kind of like a swimming pool kind of setup or stormwater detention basin if you're an engineer. And uh, so when it floods, the buildings just float. Um, so now I'll go into natural infrastructure and nature-based approaches. Um, by the way, this in the background is Marin County, where probably a lot of you are. And this is uh, San Francisco and Daly City, right where the San Andreas Fault Complex goes offshore. Um, the, the state of California recently put together uh, guidelines, guidance for implementation of natural infrastructure uh, on the coast to mitigate sea level rise or to respond to sea level rise. And the idea was to assist municipalities and others who had heard about this stuff and wanted to see whether or not it would be appropriate for their particular situation. And um, one of the uh, elements of, uh, of considering natural infrastructure is the setting. Of course, in traditional actions, a lot of times people didn't really consider the setting that much, but since we're talking about nature-based, we are, and so this graphic is just a um, kind of a, a mix of different shore morphologies or plan forms. You have um, mud flats and marshes and barrier beaches and lagoons, et cetera. Now on the right, we have two cross sections, one for the open coast and one for the estuarine environment. And these different features are located in different places. The cobble berm or beach nourishment would be down at the beach. A dune would be hopefully farther back so it doesn't get eroded all the time. Um, uh, marsh sills and tidal benches are farther back, whereas oyster reefs and eelgrass are out into the, into the bay. So I just want to go over a couple of, um, a couple of the coastal uh, natural infrastructure, natural shore infrastructure alternatives or typologies, if you will. And I think Christina is going to talk a little bit more about the estuarine um, one, San Francisco Bay. Uh, method. So here are cobble berms. So cobble berms exist in nature. Um, in the, the bottom here we have two pictures from my friend Peter Bay of uh, again Lindemar and this is a case where the uh, the winter beaches are uh, eroded, the sands moved offshore because of the higher wave energy and this is a low tide and what you see is there's a substrate of cobbles and boulders and so it's a natural feature, kind of like a rock revetment, but these are rounded and they're flatter, a little easier to traverse. And they, um, I'll go through these points at the top here. They dissipate wave energy and act as a backstop, limiting landward extent of shoreline erosion, can provide habitat equivalency for marine invertebrates and enhance natural aesthetics. Actually, um, the Arambaru project in uh, Richardson Bay area, Marin Coast, uh, there's been some observation of bird use of some of these coarser beaches. And um, I'm not a biologist, but I think that's um, pretty interesting. And then they're also a little more traversable to uh, uh, people, you know, more, it's easier to walk on these than a seawall. Uh, another uh, approach is sand dunes. <clears throat> now sand dunes um, really can vary in terms of, um, you know, what we're talking about. This uh, schematic in the upper right is from the state's uh, natural, uh, natural shore infrastructure guidelines, and it kind of tries to show uh, 
that the dunes should be some distance back from the water, otherwise the waves will just erode them very quickly. So the, the beach kind of protects the dunes and the dunes dissipate the wave runoff and provide e ecological value. And then when there's a big erosion event, release sand to buffer the erosion and then they rebuild back. And the development should really be behind them. Um, now in the upper right, we uh, image of some very nice natural dunes where there's been a lot of revegetation up in um, Eureka Humboldt Bay area. These other pictures are of Ocean Beach, San Francisco, that location I showed you earlier, South Ocean Beach, where um, there was more of a landscape type of dune uh, to cover, to, to front this fill that was built a long time ago. Of course, this is all eroded now. And so now there's a sacrificial sand placement. Uh, the sand is placed frequently, the sand erodes, it maintains the beach. It's a short-term high intensity activity. Um, here, it, here's our, some pictures of the Surfers Point project I mentioned earlier, the uh, Surfers Point Managed Retreat in Ventura, California. Um, since it was constructed, we had a big swell event in December 2015, and you can see the waves uh, exp moved the sand, exposed some cobble, ran up on the dunes, deposited a lot of organic rack. Um, the following spring, so this is December 2015, March 2016, uh, the beach is still not recovered, the, the cobble's exposed, but the dunes are still intact, the vegetation's looking good, uh, people are going surfing and kiteboarding and everything. And then a, a year and a half later in the fall, eventually the sand did build back. So this is the concept of natural infrastructure, you know, give nature room to move, you know, kind of get out of the way, let natural geomorphic processes uh, take over, you get ecology, you get access, it's beautiful, and if you can do it, it actually seems to be pretty resilient. Uh, there are stru structural natural hybrids. Uh, this again is the Ocean Beach project I mentioned earlier. Uh, one of the challenges we have here at Ocean Beach I mentioned is um, wastewater infrastructure. Well, it turns out this little circle here is a 15-foot diameter wastewater tunnel in which nobody really wants that to uh, break or fracture due to erosion. So the project includes a little bit of everything, it includes a, what we call a low profile wall to allow uh, overtopping and uh, removing of the rubble, uh, restoring the back shore, allowing the waves to wash over it. I think I'm at my 20 minutes. I think I'm, I need a few more. Um, the rest of it's going to go pretty quick and I'll speed up. But anyway, this low profile wall is based on um, uh, an example at the Terravel uh, Street, if you go to Ter the end of Terravel Street at Ocean Beach, you can see this wall, which is often um, not uh, visible, but uh, sometimes in the winter it is. Another interesting concept, this is more in the estuary, is a horizontal levee where you build a flat bench and it vegetates and you do that instead of building armory. The living levee a lot of people have heard about is uh, an extension of this where you take treated wastewater, uh, which restores the uh, brackish marsh on the back shore, which used to exist, it's been uh, lost to development. And what's interesting is the brackish marsh plants grow faster and produce more biomass so that theoretically they can actually grow up faster and mitigate sea level rise. So it's actually a living structure. Uh, innovative structures, real quickly, Santa Monica Bay, this was done in the early 1900s. They built this breakwater and it resulted in a, a salient a beach building out. Um, a, a modern version of this, which really hasn't been done yet, but a lot of people are talking about is a low crested artificial reef, which you could actually surf over, but would also provide some um, widened beach. I want to quickly, uh, this is the last two slides, talk about adaptation by zone. Um, you know, one of the concepts is to realign the shore progressively with sea level rise, uh, creating natural shore nodes between areas of high built density. So you kind of allow erosion in some places and armor in others. Now this all falls within what we call an adaptation pathway. I don't think I really have time to go through this. If we have questions, we can, but the idea is that for different amounts of sea level rise, you may implement one or more adaptation strategies, and there are thresholds and triggers. Now, my last slide is this idea of um, adaptive uh, adaptation, where you might 
assume that some armoring would be maintained. And then in some places, people wouldn't be able to hold the line and it would be erosion. And that provides an opportunity to place sand to build a beach and provide access and restore with these little habitat nodes. So you build up a um, kind of uh, crescentic overall more stable situation uh, rather than full restoration or full armoring. So that's my presentation. I'm sorry I, I took a little longer than three minutes or four minutes longer than I hoped. Um, here's my contact information and uh, this is me surfing in Indonesia a couple years ago. And this is a nice image here that I think is a nice relaxing image after going through all these um, problematic images. This is also Indonesia twilight. Wonderful presentation, Bob. Thank you so much. It, it's Thank really you. fascinating. I see in the Q&A you've been generating uh, quite a number of questions, but as we said, we are holding the questions until the end. Uh, after all the presentations and so we're also screening them uh, for what you may have uh, already copied. Your timing was spot on. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we will now move forward um, and uh, I'm delighted to introduce Christina Toms who has been an associate of ours uh, for several years. She is an ecological engineer and senior environmental scientist at the San Francisco Bay Regional Water Quality Control Board, where she leads the agency's efforts in support of tidal wetland restoration and climate change adaptation in the Bay and along the Pacific Coast. With over 17 years of experience, in the assessment and restoration of aquatic habitats and specializes in the relationship between physical processes and ecosystem responses in tidal wetland and bar built estuaries. Uh, Christina, I believe you will be sharing your own screen. Yes. Uh, please feel free to do so. Okay, can I do that right now? Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I'm a graduate of the Environmental Forum of Marin, so it's lovely to be presenting to all of you this morning. Um, thank you, Bob, for setting the stage, um, for talking about uh, some of these elements, uh, including phased adaptation. Um, so we'll just dive right into it. So I work for uh, the uh, SF Bay Regional Water Quality Control Board, which uh, we're a regulatory agency. We're a division of the California Environmental Protection Agency. And yes, we do have a very awkward name. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> So I'm gonna, here we go. So first I wanna do a really brief territory acknowledgement that we're on indigenous lands that were stolen from the Ohlone, Coast Miwok and Bay Miwok peoples. The colonization of these lands is ongoing. Few of these tribes are federally recognized and it really makes it challenging uh, for them to be integrated into environmental planning and regulatory processes. And um, that's something that we all need to fix collectively. So a uh, really quick introduction to the San Francisco estuary. Um, so I'm gonna talk a lot about the estuary and the bay. When I talk about the estuary, um, I want folks to remember that it, it's um, everything here that's in green on the map is uh, technically part of the estuary because that's the watershed in California that drains through the Delta and into, um, and into San Francisco Bay. So it's over 75,000 square miles. It is the largest estuary on the Pacific coast. Um, contains half of our fresh water, the vast majority of our coastal wetlands, and over 7 million people, which leads to a lot of conflicts. Um, the estuary, uh, because it's such a large, uh, it drains such a large watershed, um, it has some pretty uh, um, interesting gradients of sediment and salt. So if you can see my cursor here, uh, this is Sassoon, uh, Sassoon Marsh and Sassoon Bay here on the right. Um, you can see lots of sediment um, that's coming in from the watershed and from the delta. Um, that enters uh, San Pablo Bay. Um, you can see this is kind of the, the deeper part of the estuary. Um, and then here we have this plume of sediment laden water that's exiting out through the Golden Gate. Um, meanwhile, this uh, part of the South Bay and the Central Bay is kind of more like a bathtub. Water sloshes along back and forth. You can see these processes reflected in salinity gradients. This is average annual salinity. Obviously, we have big seasonal swings in salinity depending on whether or not there's a lot of runoff coming through the delta and into the bay. 
Um, but generally in Sassoon and the North Bay, we tend to have uh, more brackish conditions, whereas uh, closer to the Central Bay, um, we have uh, much more of a marine influence, uh, much higher salinity, um, and that extends down into the South Bay, except where we have um, some smaller estuarine subgradients created by Alameda Creek, uh, Guadalupe River, and Coyote Creek. So like most uh, colonized areas, San Francisco Bay has lost most of its historic tidal marshes. Uh, the map on the left is a map of tidal wetlands around the bay in uh, around 1800. Um, you can see everything that's in green, that was a tidal marsh. So the bay used to be run um, by hundreds of thousands of acres of, of tidal wetlands um, throughout most of its geographic extent. And then uh, by the early 1900s, um, and certainly by 2009, as this uh, map indicates, uh, the Baylands were tremendously changed. Uh, you see there's not a lot of that green color left. Um, everything that's purple, that's, uh, those were marshes that were reclaimed for agriculture. Everything that's yellow, you see a lot of that in Sassoon Marsh. Those are tidal marshes that were reclaimed for duck clubs and they were reclaimed into managed marshes. Um, and then in the South Bay, we have a combination of uh, marshes that were reclaimed for salt ponds. Those are the areas shown in pink. And then most of the areas in blue are, um, they're also salt ponds, but they're salt ponds that are in the process of being restored to tidal wetlands as part of the South Bay Salt Pond Restoration Project. So pretty tremendous loss of estuarine wetlands uh, around our bay. And that's really only going to get worse due to sea level rise. So this is a table uh, from the official state guidance um, on the uh, on sea level rise produced by the Ocean Protection Council. And you can see it takes a probabilistic approach to um, displaying what levels of sea level rise we might encounter over which periods of time. Um, with a likely range of sea level rise by 2050 of 0.6 to 1.1 feet, 1.6 to 3.4 feet by 2100. And then if we're um, really looking at the, the upper end of what's possible, assuming that we kind of, um, you know, uh, continue on our current emissions course and um, you know, it's important to remember that the system has a lot of momentum. Uh, climate, our climate has a lot of momentum. So um, if we take a, a, a more risk, uh, high risk aversion approach uh, to sea level rise, we could see possibly um, seven feet of sea level rise by 2100 and, and two feet of sea level rise by 2050, which, you know, reminder is only 30 years out. Um, so, you know, this is, this is a lot of sea level rise. There's a lot of change. Um, and at the same time, we're also facing an estuary with less sediment coming out of, of the delta um, and less sediment coming out of some of our tributaries due to things like dams and um, the passing of the pulse of gold rush sediment. There was hydraulic mining in the Sierras that created a tremendous amount of sediment that moved through our system and it, it is still working our way through our delta and the bay. Um, but ever since dams were constructed in the Sierra, a lot of that sediment is now getting trapped behind the dams and it's not moving downstream to nourish wetlands in the delta and the bay. And uh, very soon there's going to be a new report out that looks at how climate change might affect the future delivery of sediment to the bay. Um, it's uncertain. There's a lot of uncertainty surrounding future sediment supply in the bay, but it's unlikely to be adequate to support the existing tidal wetlands that we have in the, in the estuary, um, let alone all the tidal wetland restoration projects that are currently occurring throughout the bay. So what happens when we have rising sea levels and not enough sediment to maintain our tidal wetlands is they either erode uh, or they retreat. Um, they get squeezed behind infrastructure such as levees and uh, roads and embankments and railroads. Um, and often they drown. And so here's some modeling uh, that was done by uh, Lisa Sheely Beers um, a couple of years ago that shows under different scenarios of sea level rise and sediment supply, how our vegetated tidal marshes might actually drown and become mudflats. So in these graphics, um, the dark green color is high marsh, the light green color is low marsh, and the brown color is mudflat. And we can see how over time, uh, particularly under these scenarios such as here, where we have very high rates of sea level rise, 180 centimeters per century, and very low concentrations of suspended sediment in the system, 25 milligrams per liter, that we really see a conversion from fully vegetated tidal marsh to mudflat. And that can, that's going to create a, a lot of compounding cumulative impacts in our system. 
Um, we're already seeing from climate change, we're seeing more frequent and severe droughts and floods. Climate change isn't just driving sea level rise, but it's also driving differences in the timing, the intensity, and the duration of precipitation that hits our watersheds, the amount of water and sediment that are coming out of those watersheds. Um, it's driving coastal flooding, overtopping, and erosion. We're seeing higher groundwater tables in the margins of the bay and the drowning of our tidal wetlands. So what is my agency doing? Well, I'm gonna go through a few of these things. We're, I'm gonna talk about some of the types of um, projects that we're planning and permitting. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Adaptation Atlas. We're also amending our regulations to address the threats of climate change and especially how they threaten the resilience and the diversity of our tidal marshes. I'm not gonna talk about the regulations today because that's really getting into the weeds, but if you're interested, there's a lot more on the Water Board's website about our policy initiatives. So project planning and permitting. Um, a lot of the photos that you're gonna see today are either photos that I've taken during King Tides. Um, this is along the path in Mill Valley at Bothine Marsh, um, or they're also from the California King Tides project, which has uh, a number of um, fantastic photos online. And they provide a great uh, preview of what climate change and sea level rise is going to look like around the margins of the bay. So what are the benefits of tidal wetlands? Why are we concerned that we've already lost 80% of our marshes and that we're going to lose more thanks to sea level rise? The marshes are critical to maintaining and improving the water quality of the bay. They attenuate wave energy and flood risk around the shoreline. They protect both natural and built communities. They provide habitat for wildlife, including a number of rare and special status species like the salt marsh harvest mouse that you see here in the lower left. And they also are critical for recreation. And I think we've really learned during this coronavirus pandemic just how crucial our open spaces are um, to maintaining our physical and mental health. And in a lot of our urbanized areas, the most accessible open space that folks have is the shoreline of San Francisco Bay. This photograph here is of the San Francisco Bay Trail. I think a lot of us have really recognized just how important of a resource, um, uh, of a recreational resource the bay is during these times. So what, does, what role does the water board play uh, in ensuring a clean and healthy bay? So we, I often tell people if it's wet, we regulate it. Uh, so we regulate the placement of fill in wetlands and waters. We regulate dredging and the beneficial reuse of dredged sediment throughout the estuary. We also regulate the near shore discharge of treated wastewater. Um, Bob mentioned horizontal levees. So that's something that the water board is um, playing a big role in supporting and permitting. So we have, uh, thanks to uh, a multi-agency effort um, uh, led by the San Francisco Estuary Institute, um, there's a number of documents called the Baylands Ecosystem Habitat Goals. And the most recent goals document was produced in 2015, and it's called the Baylands and Climate Change, What We Can Do. And it has a number of recommendations for supporting resilient Baylands, uh, resilient, uh, especially resilient tidal wetlands throughout the Bay. And that includes restoring complete Baylands ecosystems. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about those in a second. Restoring connections between watersheds and the bay. Um, a lot of those connections have really been tremendously um, transformed and interrupted due to urbanization and flood control initiatives. Designing complexity and connectivity into projects at the landscape and site scales, not just thinking about postage stamps, but postage stamp restoration, but really thinking on, a, on, a, on broader spatial scales and planning for extreme events, which often drive change, you know, uh, with sea level rise and, and climate change, um, you know, sometimes things proceed, you know, in a, a, a steady linear fashion, but they often don't. And so it's important to plan for those extreme events. So the complete valence ecosystem includes both the upland and subtitle components of tidal marshes. So if this is the tidal marsh here, it's, uh, you know, we recognize that where tidal marshes are connected to uplands and where they're connected to subtidal habitats like mud flats and eelgrass feds, um, that that really provides the maximum uh, functions both for people and for ecosystems. Um, and that these are also the systems that are gonna be the most resilient to climate change. We have very few examples of complete marshes throughout our estuary. Um, two of the few are China Camp and Rush Ranch. Uh, China Camp, of course, at the State Park in Marin. Rush Ranch is a, a reserve owned by the Solano Land Trust in Sassoon Marsh. Um, these are also both sites of the San Francisco Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve. You can see that both of these sites are tidal marshes that have connectivity to uplands, even though at China Camp, a lot of this connectivity is interrupted by the presence of San Pedro Road. Um, so what are the things that we can do to create complete marshes throughout the bay? 
um, given how urbanized our estuary is. Um, Bob talked a little bit about ecotone and transition zone levees. This is where we have very gradual side slopes between the bay and the levee crest. This provides room for wetlands to establish and also room for them to march up slope driven by sea level rise. Uh, uh, currently a big ecotone levee is being constructed as part of the South Bay Shoreline Protection Project down in the South Bay. Uh, closer to Marin, you can also see one at Sears Point. Uh, this is one of my first tidal wetland restoration projects. Uh, this is um, in Sonoma County, south of Highway 37. You can see the very gradual ecotone levee here. We also have coarse beaches. Um, so beaches in San Francisco Bay are a little bit different from beaches on the outer coast. They exist in a narrower elevation band. They're only roughly between mean tide level and mean higher high water and, and above. Um, here are some examples of natural coarse beaches at Point Pinole Regional Shoreline. Uh, which is primarily sand and gravel, and then Shell Beach at Foster City, which is a very unique beach that's comprised almost entirely of, uh, of oyster shell that is um, being eroded from the mudflats and transported to the shoreline via waves. Um, these are incredibly effective at attenuating wave energy and also supporting wildlife, um, which is why here in Marin, uh, the Arambaru Island Beach Enhancement Project um, was one of the first of its kind in the estuary. Um, and within a couple years of being constructed, it already began to support oyster catchers and other um, rare local wildlife. Um, so beaches are a really fantastic tool in our toolbox for um, uh, as a nature-based strategy for adapting to climate change um, that not only protects the shoreline, but also uh, supports a number of ecosystem services. Living shorelines are another thing we can do um, to uh, uh, help uh, adapt to climate change, uh, restoring oyster reefs and eelgrass beds. Um, this is happening in Marin County off of the uh, San Rafael shoreline, uh, off of Canalways on property owned by the Marin Audubon Society. We can reconnect our watersheds to the bay and work with nature to move sediment from flood control channels where we have to spend millions of dollars annually dredging uh, our creeks. For example, Novato Creek uh, in Northern Marin County um, uh, every four years gets dredged. Um, and, and figuring out how we can more naturally move that sediment out of our flood control channels and down into the baylands to support wetlands um, so that they can keep pace with sea level rise. Here's a photograph of the Nevada Creek dredge in 2016 and again this summer. I actually have to check on that because COVID may have interrupted that, but um, uh, the county is working to beneficially reuse sediment dredged out of Nevada Creek to um, build elevation capital and increase the elevation of subsided baylands around uh, uh, in the Deer Island Basin to prepare them for eventual restoration uh, to tidal action. You can learn more about that effort on the uh, Marin County Flood Control District's website. Hamilton Wetland Restoration Project in Marin is another example of beneficial reuse of dredge material. Here, this is large scale reuse of dredge material taken from the Port of Oakland. Um, and this was, uh, this project was breached, I believe in the fall of 2014. Um, and uh, uh, this is, uh, there's a couple more projects like this throughout the estuary at uh, Montezuma uh, wetlands in, in Sassoon, uh, Sonoma Baylands um, in Sonoma County. Um, but again, this is another strategy we have to restore tidal wetlands in the estuary. Um, and we're thinking, trying to think more strategically about how we can beneficially reuse dredge sediment, both from flood control channels and from larger navigational dredging, um, and get more sediment into marshes so that they can keep pace with sea level rise and not drown. Um, Nearshore discharge of treated wastewater, this is that horizontal levee um, idea. Uh, this is a photograph of the, um, the pilot project the, at the Oroloma uh, Sanitary District plant in the East Bay. Um, this is actually using treated wastewater to artificially recreate a gradient of freshwater marsh to salt marsh um, along the edge of the bay. And um, this idea is now being planned for full-scale implementation um, in the East Bay at Palo Alto and a couple other locations throughout the estuary. I wanna see, I think we're, we're getting close on time, but I wanna um, briefly go through the Adaptation Atlas, which is a tool that uh, the Water Board has funded the San Francisco Estuary Institute to develop that is really uh, kind of a blueprint for how we might be able to utilize nature-based infrastructure in different geographies throughout the Bay 
to both uh, protect built communities from sea level rise and, while also um, supporting a healthy, diverse, functional bay. Traditionally, uh, when we look at uh, planning and regulatory jurisdictions uh, along uh, the estuary, we're looking at nine counties, 101 cities, lots of special districts, um, and a lot of vulnerable uh, frontline communities in low-lying areas, such as the Canal District in Marin City. Um, but the Bay doesn't really pay attention to these kind of arbitrary lines of governance. Um, you know, the, Mother Nature doesn't really care uh, where the boundary between Marin and Sonoma County is. Um, and, you know, so we have watershed processes and estuarine processes and ocean and bay processes that operate on these much broader spatial scales. And uh, given that, it really behooves us to develop a way for looking at climate change adaptation that crosses municipal boundaries, that crosses these kind of arbitrary uh, lines on the landscape and really works at the scale of sea level rise. Um, and so this uh, led to the development of a concept called operational landscape units or nature's jurisdictions. It's kind of an awkward phrase, but what it really does is it divides the bay into these manageable landscape scale units um, that have shared uh, physical processes, shared shoreline characteristics, um, shared watersheds and sediment supply. Um, and what that allows us to do is really integrate across the land water divide and really make the connection between adapting to climate change in the watersheds and adapting to climate change along the shorelines. And so what the Adaptation Atlas does is it divides the entire bay into 30 operational landscape units. And then for each of those units, uh, takes a look at the uh, governing physical processes and shoreline characteristics, and then determines um, what are the suite of nature-based and kind of non-structural sea level rise adaptation measures that could be effective at a landscape scale. And what this looks like, so for example, this is the Novato Operational Landscape Unit. Um, and you can see that there's a number of uh, nature-based adaptation measures that have been indicated to be helpful. That includes polder management. That's basically subsidence reversal in some of these deeply subsided areas that used to be tidal wetlands and have been diked and drained for so long that they've now subsided um, up to five, six feet, often you know, down to subtidal elevations. We can restore tidal wetlands. We can connect these uh, baylands to migration space. So marshes have room to march up slope. Uh, we can build ecotone levees so that they have room to march up slope, uh, even where we can't connect them to migration space. And then, you know, non-structural opportunities include acquiring migration space, finding the room, publicly purchasing the room for these marshes to go, um, getting easements and buyouts in open protected areas, and elevating uh, roadways such as uh, particularly Highway 37, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, is, you know, basically cuts through a number of um, subsided diked balans and is, is highly vulnerable to flooding, especially during our large winter flood events. This idea of the operational landscape unit um, has been expanded upon in Marin County with the development of the sea level rise adaptation framework. So this was a document that SFEI and Point Blue Conservation Science developed in concert with Marin County to take the ideas and the adaptation strategies that are proposed in the adaptation atlas and actually build them out into phased adaptation strategies. So again, this is going back to the Novato operational landscape unit. Um, and this looks at a number of different strategies. Um, so not just discrete ideas, but if one were to actually think through, you know, recognizing that to implement projects, there's often a considerable lead time and there are thresholds for decision making that can be difficult to predict in advance. These phased adaptation strategies um, provide a framework for decision making that's tied to thresholds of sea level rise. So you can say, okay, when we've observed six inches of sea level rise, we're gonna start planning for 12. And so these are some of the actions that we need to take. And these are all informed by kind of a, a vision for what you ultimately want the area to look like so that you don't build in measures earlier that you have to reverse later on. Basically, so you're not getting in your own way early on when it comes to sea level rise adaptation. So um, the three strategies that you see here uh, for the Novato Operational Landscape Unit, 
this top one is really about holding the line. So what if we weren't going to plan for any kind of gradual uh, retreat or realignment of, of infrastructure or resources? Um, you know, these are the strategies you might implement. But if instead your vision is to buffer climate change and buffer sea level rise with public open space, you might take this middle, round, middle ground approach. Or if you really want to maximize habitat restoration and minimize flood risk, then you would adopt the strategy on the bottom and, uh, and really maximize tidal wetland restoration uh, in, in the OLU. So I encourage all of you to take a look at that report. Um, it looks at um, not all of the OLUs um, within Marin County, just some of them, but it's a great illustration of this real, of this framework, um, this, this phased adaptation framework. So in conclusion, San Francisco, estu the estuary, um, uh, so in this case, I'm not really talking about the delta, I'm mostly talking about downstream in the bay. We've lost about 80% of our tidal wetlands since the mid 1800s and climate change threatens to drown what remains as well as the systems that we're actively restoring right now. We can support long-term tidal wetland resilience by restoring complete baylands ecosystems that are connected to uplands, to subtidal habitats in the bay, to creeks and to watersheds. An effective climate change adaptation has to be planned across multiple jurisdictions. We have to act at the scale of nature. And tools like the Adaptation Atlas can really help communities develop these phased, flexible, long-term strategies that in the long term can maximize the likelihood of tidal wetland resilience and a healthy bay and really minimize risk to the built community. So I know that that was a lot to go through in however many minutes that was, but if anyone has any follow-up questions, please don't hesitate to contact me at the water boards. And also if you just Google San Francisco Bay Water Board Climate Change, it'll bring you to the website of the programs that I lead at the water board and I'm happy to, to talk more about those if there are any questions. I just wanted to remind everybody that the Q&A is open. If you have any questions, please go ahead and enter those in the Q&A. Um, we will be compiling those and asking our hosts at the end if they can answer some of those questions for you. Meanwhile, to introduce myself, my name is Anne Christine Strugnell and I am the EFM board member responsible for communications. I'm also a writer, which makes me super excited to be introducing our next speaker, Elizabeth Rush, who is the author of a truly beautiful book, which is a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in general nonfiction. That book is called Rising, Dispatches from the New American Shore. In writing this book, Elizabeth spent several years exploring the issue of sea level rise by visiting affected places, um, going out with scientists to marshlands and other areas that were being impacted and talking to the people whose homes and livelihoods are actually being threatened right now by sea level rise. So one of the quotes on the cover says, the book on climate change and sea level rise that was missing might say, what's missing? Well, much of what you read and hear about sea level rise talks about what it's going to look like. Bob and Christina this morning have done a great job of showing us images and explaining to us what sea level rise is going to look like in the Bay Area. But Elizabeth is going to round out our perspective by telling us about what sea level rise feels like to the people that are affected by it. So you can learn more about Elizabeth on the website. I'll just say that she's an accomplished writer with serious credibility in the scientific community. And she's currently at work on a new book about motherhood and Antarctica's diminishing glaciers, which I'm sure will also be a great read. But first, let's talk about rising. Elizabeth, are you there? We're delighted to have you join us today. I'm here, Anne. Thank you so much. You all should see the screen now, is that correct? Looks great, thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks so much for having me, and thanks to everyone for showing up um, to talk about the ongoing climate crisis. Uh, a big thank you to the Environmental Forum of Marin for hosting, um, to Kim for arranging, and Anne for the introduction. And also I was really moved um, and excited by Christina and Bob's fabulous presentations. I think in many ways um, as Anne suggested, I'm here to kind of put a human face onto on the projects that they were talking about over the past hour. So it's a real honor to be with you here today. And today I'm going to speak to you about this book, Rising Dispatches from the New American Shore, which is an on the ground investigation of the impact that sea, levels, sea level rise is having on different coastal communities all around the country. 
And for those of you who haven't read it, each of the book's nine chapters opens with what I call a monologue. Um, and it's delivered in the voice of one of the residents um, of the areas that that chapter is gonna focus in on. And in those monologues, the residents talk about sort of the event that woke them up to their vulnerability and what they decided to do with that knowledge. So it's a book about climate change and in particular sea level rise, but it doesn't focus necessarily on the science behind the phenomenon. Instead, I think it looks to people living on climate change's front lines and it asks what we might learn from them about the future that we all share. So um, I'm gonna zoom us out of San Francisco Bay and move us over to New York City. Uh, today's presentation will focus on the eastern side of Staten Island, a place that Hurricane Sandy really both undid and remade from the ground up. And by digging into one particular community on the eastern side of Staten Island, Oakwood Beach, um, and also the story sort of behind that story, I want to explore a really fundamental question whose voices have also been traditionally left out of environmental discussions and how might climate, the climate crisis itself help to us, help us to make this conversation more whole going forward. So Joan Didion famously wrote, we tell ourselves stories in order to live. Um, and she wrote that in her essay, The White Album, which I think sort of tries and fails to make sense of how the idealism of the 60s and California's golden dream gave way to, was kind of consumed by a sense of cynicism that accompanied uh, the Manson murders and then the other things that start, get the 70s started. And she says in that essay that storytelling works as a sense-making practice, at least until it doesn't that there are moments and phenomena that really test and rend our ability to arrive at a narrative line. And I think climate change is among them. Um, and yet I think that we keep trying to tell this story in a kind of straightforward manner with conventional narrative news techniques and um, reporting. So in 2011, I started to write about sea level rise for a number of different journalistic publications. But after about a year of covering the beat, I started to grow really bored by the language that I had to use just to get climate change into the news. So each um, of these like unique and unprecedented events that I was covering started to sound really eerily familiar. Climate change, I started to realize, is sort of entering into our contemporary culture as a never-ending set of record-breaking statistics, right? Record-breaking storms, record-breaking heat waves, record-breaking rain, each successive extreme smashes the previous record-breaking record. And when I wrote about climate change in that way, I started to feel like I was dulling readers, myself, to some of the dynamism at the heart of this moment of transformation. I think the apocalyptic headlines can also overlook the ways in which climate change is impacting vulnerable communities, and more importantly, in some cases, bringing those communities closer together in new and unexpected ways. So I started to suspect that climate change news tells the story straight and yet confuses us into thinking that the conclusion itself is kind of foregone. So by describing climate change in this manner, I think we steal from it some of its mystery, some of what Amitav Ghosh calls its improbability or uncanniness. And I think in doing so, we really steal from ourselves the possibility that we could be transformed and not only for the worse um, by this disruptive force. So I was working um, at the College of Staten Island and living in Brooklyn when Hurricane Sandy hit. And this is a map that shows the Hurricane Sandy inundation. So over 400,000 New Yorkers were inundated during the storm. 17% of the city's total land mass was underwater. But as you'll come to find out in today's talk, um, those impacts really weren't evenly distributed. In the weeks after the storm, um, Staten Island, which is here, um, and which is where I worked, that Staten Island really entered into a state of quiet crisis. So my university closed for a number of weeks, the ferry stopped running, 
Um, one day I drove across the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, which is here to deliver a bunch of um, supplies to a help center at New Dorp High School and all along Father Capadano Boulevard, which is this road, there were boats literally smashed into single story ranch homes. And I knew that that is a neighborhood where many of my students lived and that their lives, their homes had come undone in ways that I didn't truly understand. Um, so when the, when the university reopened, many of my students didn't return. Um, generally speaking, CSI students work and go to school at the same time, and those whose homes were impacted by Sandy often moved into temporary FEMA housing, sometimes um, as far away as New Jersey, or they stayed with friends and family. And in the storm's wet wake, they had this really difficult decision to make. Should they drop out of school or stop working? And for many, I think it's not surprising that uh, their education took a back burner to financial security. And some of my students never would make it back to school after Hurricane Sandy. But when I read about the storm in the newspaper, those stories didn't appear. Um, I think you could say that that's when I knew that the coverage of the storm and all that it gestured towards in my mind was incomplete. Um, I wondered where were my students' stories? Where were the stories of those who flooded before Sandy, who'd already blown through their retirement savings, getting back into their flooded homes after Irene a year earlier? So I started to spend a lot of my spare time out on the eastern shore of Staten Island interviewing residents about their Sandy experience. Um, and in particular, you know, once once the newspapers had all gone away, the long, frustrating path to recovery that followed. I didn't drive a car. I would instead bike out there and then walk, going door to door, asking for folks to share with me their storm stories. And I felt like if I had entered these vulnerable communities and asked residents to share with me a traumatic experience, um, I needed to make myself vulnerable too. So sometimes I would share a personal story about a time in my life when someone or something that I loved was hurting me. Um, also that decision to ride a bike to go on foot, that was part of this idea of making myself vulnerable, of knocking on doors and asking to be led into strangers' living rooms. Um, all of that is to say that I started to leave my climate change discourse at the door. And I decided instead that I wanted to engage in a conversation and to listen. Um, I started to spend whole afternoons in Oakwood Beach and Midland and Ocean Breeze. And out there I found that residents had started to organize, to publicly ask that their homes be purchased and demolished and that the state aid in relocation. So this is part of what Bob was talking about um, in his presentation around what managed retreat is, but this was a really, um, interesting situation in which residents were asking to be moved. So this, more than anything about Sandy and its aftermath, really surprised me. It was that clamor rising from the sodden side of the city's literally only Republican borough. The signs that read, Mother Nature wants her land back and buyout wanted, buyout needed. I wanted to know what residents of this right-leaning, often climate change denying, low-lying, working-class neighborhood knew that the rest of us did not. And I wanted to know why they were interested in retreat, one of the most progressive and, as Bob mentioned, controversial adaptation strategies there is for sea level rise. So residents in these flood-prone communities started to um, organized what they called grassroots buyout committees, where they went door to door educating their neighborhoods on what it might mean to retreat from rising seas and how this adaptation strategy might serve them. Um, so each homeowner would get pre-storm prices for their lots. The recovery time would be quick, um, relatively quick compared to the city's Build It Back program, which became mired in bureaucratic red tape and often took as much as five years for folks to get help through that, through that program if they opted into it. And finally, you know, it's really the only adaptation technique that helps you permanently move away from risk. And 
What I found really moving was that residents knew that they had to carry this information into the community in a horizontal way, um, that it couldn't come as a demand on high, that it had to be something that was discussed in a really organic way. And I think these maps that they drew to sort of keep track of their progress, the green properties, um, are ones where residents had expressed interest in being bought out, the red ones where they said no, um, and the ones that don't have, that have that tan color in the more computerized map, um, those are ones that were sort of on the fence. I think this shows sort of the organic nature of the way this, or, this buyout um, was organized throughout the eastern shore, shore of Staten Island. So, oh, I had been researching about Oakwood Beach researching, writing, interviewing in Oakwood Beach for a little over a year when a woman named Patty Schneider, one of the organizers of these buyout committees, um, invited me to a party to celebrate the life of her brother, Leonard Montalto. He um, is one of the people that died during Hurricane Sandy. And when I arrived, um, Patty introduced me to her niece, Nicole, Leonard Montalto's daughter. And Nicole grabbed me by the arm and said to me, um, I'll never forget it. She said, you're writing a book, so I am going to tell you what happened during Hurricane Sandy because you will help me memorialize my father. Um, she dragged me into the guest bedroom and uh, she spoke for almost two hours and I recorded our conversation and I just listened. Um, so what I'd like to do is read briefly um, from Nicole's testimony, which opens the chapter on Oakwood Beach and Rising. Um, because I want to bring Nicole's voice into our conversation and because I want to acknowledge, and I'll talk about this a little bit um, after I read from her testimony, that it was really her voice that taught me how to write Rising and how to include the voices of those long sort of left on the margins, how to pull those into this conversation. So this is Nicole speaking. Um, we come into this story and Hurricane Sandy has hit and they can't find her father, so they're searching for him. I went into my house. I was screaming for my dad. Everything was upside down. The couches floated to different areas. My bed was up on the wall. The only things that didn't move were my dining room table and the filing cabinet because both were too heavy. That was where my dog took sanctuary, on the filing cabinet. My cat was sitting there on top of my bed. I didn't see my dad. I thought, shit, maybe he left. Maybe he went to someone else's house. But then I thought he wouldn't leave the animals. My dad's wallet was still in his room. There was something else too that he left behind. I don't remember what it was. The wallet, that was the biggest thing. It had his money and his ID. He wouldn't have left the house without those things. Oh, I know what it was. He was on and off with smoking cigarettes. I'm the same way too. And he left his pack at the table and a couple of butts that we never smoked in the house. It's so weird to timeline things. I mean, I spoke with him on the phone. He said it was good I got out when I did. The water was rushing in. He was on the basement stairs when he was on the phone with me. Did he come back up and smoke two cigarettes? Was that before or after? I saw these things that were cluing me into the idea that he never left the house. When I started seeing those things, I went down to the basement and began screaming. I was hoping that I would hear him, but at the same time, I wasn't. My dad's friends, once they knew he was missing, they broke all the windows in the basement to get the water out. They started pumping that water out too. People say he was down there for the pump, but I don't see how it could have been the pump because the basement was already flooded. What the hell could a pump do? When we pulled up on Wednesday morning, my father's friend told us that they had found him. My father was in my sister's room in the basement. It's tough to see this neighborhood that I grew up in, that my father grew up in, that my sisters grew up in. I mean, we spent our entire lives there being demolished. But on the other side, it's nice knowing that this is to protect everyone else and that it can't happen again. <laughs> 
at least it can't happen to the people I know and the people I love. And maybe the government really will do the right thing and let Oakwood go back to nature. After the storm, we were like, we're moving to a hill. And I moved to a hill. By the time I was 26, I lived through two major floods, one of which took my father's life. Home was that house. It was my dad. It was my mom. It was my sisters. And when my dad was gone, it wasn't home anymore. So those words, when my dad was gone, it wasn't home anymore. Um, they stuck with me for a really long time. Karen Desai, the winner of the Man Booker Prize for her diasporic novel, The Inheritance of Loss, recently said, we talk so much about the vocabulary of belonging, but ours is an age of refugees. We need literature that's multiple in nature, that explores, for instance, the idea that an immigrant searching for home will undo our very notions of home. Desai's words, I think, call to us to invite new voices into the conversation, to produce literature that denies the idea that there is an official story of any event or one clear linear narrative. And here in Desai echoes of the awareness that Nicole Montalto was forced into when Sandy took her father's life. I think hers is a story of profound dislocation, of looking for her father and by extension her home where he ought to be and discovering that not only is he not there, he's literally nowhere. And I think it's this discovery that would untether her from her childhood home and would play a really significant role in fueling Nicole and Patty and many of their neighbors to advocate for and eventually win the right to pull up their roots and relocate in. Um, but I think it's one of the reasons. I also don't think it's the only reason. So I think in order to get a fuller picture of where this desire to retreat comes from, um, we have to reach back in time. And you know, again, I, I think back to the maps that we've seen in the previous presentations and how similar some of these maps really are. So the map on the left here, um, is a detail from a 1900 USGS map showing the wetlands of Staten Island. And you can see all of these areas that are shaded this darker color of blue are all tidal wetlands. And at the time of maps drawing were deemed unfit um, for human use. And I found that as I developed, delved sort of further into New York City's past, the more this pre-urban landscape seemed to shape our present day predicament, not just in terms of topography, but also in terms of demographics. Because um, another thing that I discovered is that it's not just millionaires who live along the shore. It's often some of our most vulnerable citizens who put down spindly roots in swampland. Um, so the second image shows social vulnerability um, mapped atop flood risk, and perhaps, you know, it will come as a surprise that some of the most flood prone areas in Staten Island are inhabited by those deemed medium to high risk um, socially. They're lower income communities of color. So you know, I think it's important that the trauma experienced in this neighborhood during Sandy uh, didn't begin on October 30th, didn't begin with Sandy, though that night would prove to be a particularly violent moment where social vulnerability was rendered visible. Um, there were 24 deaths during Sandy on Staten Island, more than half of all the deaths to occur in New York City. And the majority of those took place atop land that was um, formerly wetlands. So you know, these traumas, I think, really contributed to the idea that these neighborhoods, once so beloved, had perhaps ceased to offer the comfort that we think of as being synonymous with home. The storm and its devastating impact is one of the reasons the residents of the Forgotten Borough became interested in managed retreat as a recovery strategy. So I think that, again, has this like deeper historical um, set of circumstances surrounding it. We often think the word implies, retreat implies defeat in a military setting. 
But on the eastern shore of Staten Island, after the storm that took Leonard Montalto's life, I think retreat started to sound like relief. Relief from flooding that had defined so many of these residents' lives. For a long time, I really didn't know what to do with Nicole's story. I remember going home after the celebration of her father's life and transcribing our conversation word for word. And then I put it in a file on my desktop labeled Oakwood Beach Interviews. And there it sat for years. Um, I felt like there was nothing I could do as a writer, as an essayist that would add any value to what Nicole had already said. Um, eventually, literally like four or five years later, I ran into the work of Svetlana Aleksevich and in particular her book, Voices from Chernobyl, which tells the story of the nuclear disaster and its aftermath entirely from the perspective of those who lived through the events. It's composed of like 96 different monologues. And when I read her work, I began to understand how powerful it is when someone speaks in the first person about an event that would reshape the trajectory of their entire life. So many people have asked me about the process behind the creation of the testimonies or dispatches or monologues that ground rising. And that has led me to sort of reflect on what distinguishes my work from some more traditional journalism. And I think for me, it's all about where the res writer's responsibilities lie. I think a traditional journalist is responsible to the body public, to inform public discourse. And with these testimonial style essays, I've always felt that my first obligation was to the interviewee, to the speaker of the monologue. I wanted to make sure that I was getting their story right. So once I had a transcription and I cut out about 95% of what was there to get this smooth narrative arc, um, I would send it to them and ask for feedback. And I wanted really the interviewees to be collaborators in the creation of the book. I wanted them to sign off on their story, making its way into the world in this way. It was always really scary for me to do that. Um, some folks, you know, said like, oh, it's fine the way it is. And others like Nicole were very meticulous in wanting to shape it. Um, and, you know, when I first sent it to Nicole, I was really afraid that she wouldn't want me to use it. But I also knew that if she didn't want me to use it, I didn't want it to be in the book. And I think that using it without her approval sort of felt too akin to many of the practices of the kind of extractive industry that lie at the heart of the climate crisis. I wanted my work to be part of a healing process where residents really gained agency over their stories just as hopefully they're gaining agency over some of their circumstances. Because I think um, above all else, one of the things that scares us most about climate change is that threat of losing control. So with Nicole, we edited the piece back and forth um, until she felt like it represented her storm experience, which is to say that for me, the testimonies really aren't an example of giving voice. Um, some folks have said, oh, your testimonies give voice to these frontline communities. I think of them um, as, you know, these residents have always had voices of their own. Instead, this creative enterprise to me means giving them uh, a microphone, living, giving those who've long been kept out of official discourse a platform on which to speak. So the more I worked on this project, the more I learned that resiliency really means different things in different places. So in Manhattan, sea level rise resilience means in the case of the plan that won the Rebuild by Design competition that you see here on the left, um, landscape berms with seagrass and habitat supports, levees that double as skate parks and amphitheaters, seawalls that support pop-up cafes and passive recreation. And well, meanwhile in Staten Island, resiliency really meant taking out a second mortgage on your storm-wrecked home with mold creeping up the walls. It meant scrubbing the mold off the walls yourself. This is an image of John Hijnacki, um down at the local VFW. And you know, you see the two different colors of brick here. This is the VFW. This is the water line. And all the bricks that are this lighter color sat under salt water for days. And then, you know, he was part of the team that cleaned them in the storm's aftermath. 
So, you know, on Staten Island, resilience meant waiting for months, sometimes years for the city's build it back program to lift a house. It meant getting shorted on your flood insurance claim by FEMA and one of the largest scales, largest scale examples of fraud in the federal agency's history. I think, again, these unjust circumstances, the history of flooding in the neighborhood brought residents together to fight for a fair storm recovery and one that they were electing themselves. So one thing I've heard again and again as I've worked on rising and sea level rise all around the country is that residents, um, certainly in, when I started working on this book, residents often really felt alone with their plight. They knew of no one else who shared their circumstances. And I think in the absence of that information, people often choose to safeguard their homes themselves, to build retaining walls out of bricks and sandbags and stone, to lift their homes up on stilts. As Harvey bore down um, on Houston, Kristen Massey attempted to wrap her ranch in heavy duty plastic sheeting after shelling out $130,000 to repair it in the back-to-back -back memorial and tax day floods two years prior. But despite her efforts, her home still filled with water displacing her and her family for the third time in three years. And I think, you know, she would learn what so many are becoming aware of, that overwhelmingly individual flood fixes fail. And I, you know, I saw a question about that um, in the chat uh, in response to one of the earlier talks. So I'd love to also talk about that, you know, in our conversation afterward. I will say though, at the same time, and this interface should all look surprisingly familiar to you. Um, this is, well, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about what this image is um, in a minute. So during the same sort of 10 years that I've been working on sea level rise and recording it all around the country and watching the United States inundated again and again by record-breaking storms, I found another really powerful phenomenon has started to unfold. So all across the country, there are these community-led flood survivor groups that are popping up. There's Residents Against Flooding in Houston, Low Country Flooded States of America in Charleston, a Community Voice in New Orleans, and on and on and on. And many begin um, in advance of a storm and start as a kind of information sharing network around where to get sandbags, the location of shelters, weather predictions, and once the floodwaters recede, the focus shifts to the long, arduous process of recovery, covering everything from how to file a flood claim to which contractors are least likely to rip you off. Um, the most promising thing for me is that increasingly these flood groups are joining together. So Higher Ground, a nationwide coalition of flood survivors was started in 2017. And since then, their membership has already um, exploded to include over 100,000 people. Every month, community leaders from these different frontline communities get together via Zoom um, and discuss what they've learned as they have attempted to adapt to rising sea levels in their area. So that's what you see here. This is just a screenshot of one of the Zoom conversations that they have every month. Back before Zoom was really popular and we all spent all our lives on Zoom all the time, they were doing this, <laughs> which I think is really fabulous. So in addition to connecting these frontline communities to each other, Higher Ground also connects them with pro bono legal and scientific counsel. They've helped file lawsuits against unlawful wetlands development, um, unjust use of flood pumps during storm events. They've appealed development permits and hosted educational forums to inform residents in their community about sort of underlying infrastructure issues that exacerbate flooding, the role that climate change plays in amplifying their pre-existing vulnerabilities. And I think in doing so, they're teaching each other and me and all of us that it's really myopic to address flooding at an individual level. Because the scale at which climate change is transforming our world, I think is most productively addressed by collective responses at the local, state, and federal level. And I'd be also happy to talk in the Q&A about, you know, some different really groundbreaking um, manage retreat sort of policy experiments that are unfolding in Louisiana and Norfolk, Virginia, if that's of interest to folks. So 
Zooming back in briefly on Oakwood Beach to sort of wrap up that story, eventually Governor Cuomo listened to the residents and over the course of a couple years, he purchased and demolished 600 homes along the eastern shore of Staten Island. So gosh, three years ago, I had the opportunity to go back to Oakwood Beach and to visit two and a half um, and to visit with each of the community leaders who were successful in securing the buyout all lived within five miles of their original homes, up on a hill and out of the floodplain. And we ate lunch at, our, at their same old seafood restaurant, their favorite place. And thanks to the 5% closing bonus that the state offered, they told me that 80% of residents stayed on the island, which is to say that the buyout itself didn't necessarily shatter the community. It didn't lead to the hemorrhaging of property taxes, as is often feared. Um, residents kept going to the same butcher, the same baker, same grocers. They still hung out together on the weekends. They went down to Oakwood to fish. Their community remained intact, but what had changed was their immediate vulnerability to flooding. And perhaps even more interesting, when I asked what they thought of the new flood wall that was being built along the eastern shore of the island, their response was really surprised me. They said, that's only a temporary fix. Seas are rising and it's going to give people a false sense of comfort. And I thought, I spent a long time thinking about what moved those residents from climate change denial to acceptance. And I don't actually think it was flooding that generated that change. Many had been initially reticent to speak about climate change, um, but once they saw that it didn't necessarily mean that the, that climate change, acknowledging climate change didn't necessarily mean the end of the things they treasured most in their community. I felt like that was when they started to be able to call out climate change as one of the factors that instigated their move. I think also important was that they were starting to gain agency over what they wanted to do in response to climate change. So, I think we need only to look to Oakwood Beach for the kind of electric possibility that climate change can awaken in us. Communities that are, when communities are long, that have long been made vulnerable to uh, existing structural inequalities are directly impacted by climate change. I think it can awaken not only an awareness of vulnerability, but more importantly, that that vulnerability is shared at local and increasingly um, national levels. I think this realization brought the residents of Oakwood together to demand access to one of the most progressive sea level rise adaptation techniques we have. And at an even more basic level, it just inspired them to raise their voices and regain control over their community's destiny. So looking back to that Joan Didion line where she writes, we tell ourselves stories in order to live. I think my work on rising regularly reminded me that the right to speak about one's own shifting relationship to the environment and to have that story heard is something that ought to be extended equally to all, regardless of the specific language they choose to use, and yet all too often really isn't. So I think it may sound deceptively simple, and maybe it is, but when a conversation that's long been dominated by a select few, um, when a conversation that's really been dominated by just a few people starts to shift, starts to loosen, I think in, that, in the space of that conversation, listening is a really potent act, and it can upend historic power balances. Um, as tides get higher and storms stronger, those long exposed to flooding who've lived in areas where property taxes cannot, will not cover the cost of innovative infrastructure solutions, I think these people have precious knowledge that the rest of us do not. And I think as the words they alight upon and excavate and share become part of the vernacular that we use to describe these uncanny and improbable days, that's also how this phenomenon is can, will become more than just a catalyst for cataclysm. I think as the climate change language loosens, becomes more democratic, our ability to seize the moment as an opportunity, as a kind of opportunity for coalition building, especially amongst those long made vulnerable by other structural problems is growing. 
and perhaps together we'll make that ever more popular protest chant come true. The seas are rising and so are we. So thank you all. And um, I'm excited for a conversation that'll follow. Wow. <laughs> That was amazing, Elizabeth. That was really beautiful. Um, thank you so much for bringing these voices to us, because I think that, like you say, they are voices we don't usually hear, and yet they tell a different story than we have been picking up, and a much more empowering and potentially transformative story. So thank you so much for that. We're going to take another five. Um, and uh, also, I, I actually wanted to talk about something that I don't think is in the book, Elizabeth, I'm not totally sure, but you talked about some new and interesting policies on managed retreat that are being tried. And I think you said Louisiana. I just want to like start with that because you made a reference to it in talking. And I'm like, wait, 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 I want to hear more. So can you speak sure. to that? Um, I think this also sort of speaks to a couple of the questions that are popping up in the Q&A. Yeah. Um, so I'll speak briefly about two different um, sort of innovative policy trial programs that are happening in Norfolk, Louis Norfolk, Virginia, and across the state of Louisiana that have sort of come online since Rising was published. Um, one thing they're testing out in Norfolk, and this might be interesting um, in terms of thinking about its relevance in um, the Bay Area, is if a developer wants to develop on a high dry parcel of land, they have to earn resiliency credits. And one of the ways in which um, Norfolk is experimenting with ways to earn resiliency credit is by um, purchasing and relocating highly flood prone properties. So Norfolk, Virginia has a lot of, a lot of residential and commercial areas that are um, you know, flooding, even with sunny day flooding right now. Um, and so they're saying, you know, if you're a developer and you want to come into this area and you want some of the best land that we have left, um, you're going to have to help us move and relocate some of the people that are here, have been here long before you decided to set out and embark on this um, undertaking. And so this year they're trying they're moving four different um, parcels through the program. So, you know, at different, you know, commercial parcels, lower income parcels, higher income parcels to see sort of how the economics of it might work out in terms of uh, how do you sort of monetize managed retreat. There's also, this gets a little bit wonky, but um, the National Flood Insurance Program has something called the Community Rating System which helps local municipalities lower the rate at which people, individuals pay for, lower the flood insurance rates at the individual level, but community-wide, if the community um, can show proof of implementing certain kinds of adaptation strategies. And so different things earn you different credits, and those credits help you lower the cost overall of flood insurance in the area. And so they're also sort of looking at, okay, if we're going to purchase and demolish these properties and then turn them into open space, that's going to help residents lower their flood insurance premiums. Um, how can we sort of place a specific monetary value on that? Um, so we can talk about, again, sort of the ways in which we might monetize retreat and show that it's in the long term also uh, sort of in a cost benefit analysis kind of way, something productive to engage in. The example in Louisiana is a little bit less sort of policy wonky based, but one of the things that they're doing, they have something called the LA Safe program and they've released these maps of the entire Louisiana coastline that sort of codes the coastline according to flood risk vulnerability and shows places that are at you know high likelihood to have to engage with managed retreat medium likelihood and lower likelihood and then in those different communities they are showing these maps and engaging in you know community-based conversations around the information that the maps contain 
But the really cool thing about the program is that it's a program that has a fair amount of funding behind it. And so they've chosen, I think, eight different pilot communities. And they're saying, you know, now that you can see, now that we've sort of mapped this risk and done sort of different models of future sea level rise and made those visible for you, we're going to give you money to engage, embark on two different adaptation projects of your choosing within, you know, a certain monetary value. And it's fascinating to watch that unfold because you'll have communities that will say, okay, we want to use some of that funding to retreat from X, Y, or Z area. And then we want to use the other part of our funding to build, you know, an offshore break or to put in a horizontal levee to try to buffer and safeguard another area. So I think one of the things that people get really nervous about with managed retreat is like, oh, well, we're not going to abandon all of the coastline all at the same time. And that's not really, I think, what's on the table. Um, and it's interesting to think about empowering communities to make their own decisions about the places that they think collectively they want to hold on to and they're willing to put funding towards and other places that they are a little bit more comfortable with um, letting go of and saying like, okay, we can still be who we are without, you know, Elm Street. Maybe the thing that we really want to hold on to is the marina or, um, you know, whatever, <laughs> however you want to balance those two things out. But I think the key there is that it's about empowering communities to make the decision themselves and not doing a sort of like nationwide top down um, set of regulatory rules that dictate who and what gets to stay and where and why. Well, it also sounds like that's kind of, um, it's a process of changing away from uh, the current state, which is that flood insurance companies have typically required homeowner, homeowners to rebuild in place. So is this, so this is part of a gradual evolution away from that because some of the questions that come in about that specific about advocate people who have been flooded multiple times and all that so i think what you're saying is that there's a tr piloting transition in, in different places towards a more flexible approach to flood insurance and so though these are pilot uh, programs potentially we could see a lot more of this um fine-tuning responsiveness to local circumstances and local wishes would you say that's correct? I think that's true, but so far the two mechanisms that I'm talking about in many ways don't actually change the regulations around flood insurance. So they're kind of like doing their own thing. Um, I'm not sure if Christina or Bob could speak more directly to this. And if I'm putting you on the spot, yeah. you know, don't don't mm -hmm. don't feel obliged to answer but i know that the national flood insurance program you know is still in sort of the throes of thinking about do we want to fundamentally change some of those requirements that folks rebuild in place it's certainly one of the most costly elements of the program in its current state yeah i could comment on that a little bit um there, there is a, a, a movement, I guess, um, you know, with a climate change adaptation, mitigation and adaptation, but adaptation in particular is somewhat ad hoc, but there is a movement towards um, integrating hazard mitigation plans, which uh, relates to the flood insurance, FEMA flood insurance program, um, with climate adaptation. And, and the big kind of nexus there is to go ahead and uh, to think of events like you know Sandy as as something that's going to happen more frequently, or if you adapt to sea level rise by you know reducing your flood risk, you're reducing your existing flood risk. So you know under existing conditions, so you can kind of use the existing um, program flood insurance program and hazard mitigation construct within a climate adaptation um, driver, if you will, or in response. It's still a little different. Um, one of the problems we have, uh, and I think the East Coast is gonna have more and more, uh, is more of a progressive loss of land. 
as as the shore erodes in response to not just inundates but actually erodes and that's been an issue here in california a lot of people feel like well if you're in high ground you're okay but you know our coast is uplifted and is on a leading edge of a continent and so it's been eroding for five thousand years and uh we just figure that out when all, everything's right up to the back door so we have a progressive change and so we're losing land but following what you were saying um elizabeth uh you know in san francisco bay which is an estuarine environment a lot of the adaptation is in terms of redevelopment there's just like so much money to be made actually apparently in commercial and residential development in san francisco bay area and so people are filling the land and raising great elevations six feet and that all pencils out fine apparently um on the pacific coast we're having issues and of course uh because the land is the shore is migrating and there, you know, so we haven't really gotten to a redevelopment concept, but I think that's another way to look at things is in terms of coastal redevelopment. The problem on the Pacific coast is we've run out of space. You know, we've got open space um, that is protected. We have built space that is kind of fully developed unless you go up. The shores eroding. You know, people are having trouble getting their heads around what we're gonna do. So they decide they wanna armor and there's really no funding for that. So we really, on the on the Pacific coast, we're really having a major problem in, in California that hasn't been solved. But in the Bay area, on the Bay side, it seems a little bit better. And then of course the disadvantaged communities, the poorer communities, um, which may not wanna be redeveloped for with expensive housing, uh, or, or it, it, you know that that's a real challenge for for us as well. I think um, I don't know, Christina. Would you? Yeah, I I think San San Francisco Bay is a little bit of a unique environment in that um, the number of homes and homeowners that are actually um, threatened by coastal flooding, um, at least directly along the shoreline, not talking of not really bringing into account fluvial and groundwater processes, but immediately along the shoreline, um, most of San Francisco Bay is ringed by commercial industrial development or infrastructure, um, you know, railroads, roads, uh, uh, Highway 101, 880, you know, that, um, well, not exactly 880, but um, you know, that sort of, of infrastructure. So it's a little bit of a, there's actually relatively not that many places where there's housing and people immediately adjacent, you know, living immediately adjacent to the Bay. Marin being one of the places in the Bay where that's, where um, that is, where that is the case, where there actually is housing that's, that's threatened. Um, so, you know, it's it's a little bit different with regards to the redevelopment and the and the insurance situation. Um, one of my frustrations in in the Bay, um, which is is somewhat less of an issue on the outer coast, is that there are still some communities in the Bay that are still putting housing in subsided dike baylands that is in the path of sea level rise. So. You know, when people say, well, what's something we can do? Well, the, the very first thing we can do is quit making the problem bigger. Um, <laughs> and this is where, you know, issues of governance come into play. Um, a lot of communities in, in the Bay Area are, um, you know, at least thinking about climate change adaptation and, and putting, you know, trying to take assets out of the flood zone and how they can do realignment. Um, then, to be frank, you have um, some communities, for example, the city of Newark, um, recently approved the construction of over 400 luxury homes in subsided diked balins that are surrounded by salt ponds. And so when you have kind of these outliers, it's really hard to address these broader issues of governance and insurance and who pays because we're still putting assets, we're still building new assets that are at risk. And um, that's, that's less of a situation on the immediate Pacific coast, but it's, it's a very, very frustrating situation. And it's largely because, you know, it's just so valuable. The land is so valuable that it's very, very difficult to, you know, for some communities to resist the, the instinct to develop um, instead of, you know, prepare for eventual retreat and, and nature-based solutions. You know, uh, just real quickly, um, this idea of, linking the vulnerable communities to the less vulnerable communities and uh, or land and better apparently 
now worth more in the market uh, in that Norfolk example that you brought up, Elizabeth. That's really interesting. But there's been a lot of talk here about transfer of development credits, transfer of development rights, but kind of the problem is that, you know, if you live on the coast, it's, there's not necessarily an equivalent. So, um, and then if you're in a town like Pacifica where I am, there's really um, not that much space to transfer the development, right? So there's been talk about doing this more regionally. So maybe moving people closer to a transit station, you know, uh, where, you know, it integrates with other ideas such as um, uh, public transportation and, um, you know, pedestrian type movements and stuff rather than right on the coast or, you know, between the coast and a freeway or something. Um, so that, that, that kind of land use policy is a really interesting way to go and to try to, you know, affect the incentives, you know, that, that perhaps that's something we can think more about. It also makes me think, you know, Christina thinking about absolutely the, like the, does, how do you get people to resist developing in areas that are, um, highly sought sought out desirable i know that one thing i don't know you know where san francisco is in this in this moment but one thing that we see with the national flood insurance program is that the, you know they're in a constant process of updating those maps right of trying to determine where the 100 year floodplain is where the 500 year floodplain is and i know for instance in new york city um they were in the middle of you know, reassessing the flood maps when Sandy hit and the new proposed maps literally, you know, basically mirror the Sandy inundation and the city fought them, fought FEMA on them because they said, you know, we can't price, we can't double, it essentially doubled the size of the proposed floodplain in New York City and the city said, we can't double the size of the floodplain. You're going to price poor people out of their homes, which is absolutely true. Um, if you, you know, flood insurance is mandatory if you have a mortgage. Um, so, you know, you have this proposed floodplain. It mapped the Sandy inundation, but the city said, no way, we can't possibly have that be our flood floodplain. They hired an outside firm, Arcadis, to, to contest the flood maps. And they came up with a proposed floodplain, you know, that shrunk the floodplain back to, basically what was the the earlier image that FEMA worked from, you know, for the past 20, 30 years. And the city eventually won that fight and the larger floodplain wasn't adapted, but the city said, you know, as a kind of consolation prize, we're going to make, um, we're going to change the the building code and if you want to develop in this low-lying area now you have to develop with six feet of sea level rise in mind or whatever you know number they came up with so now you're getting these buildings in new york city that are right along the water that are insanely expensive and you know that have whatever the first two stories are parking lot so they can be used as sort of like a flood zone that the waters can wash through so it's interesting to also watch, you know, you're absolutely right that the first thing we have to do is stop making the problem bigger. And there's like all of these strange workarounds that happen in terms of um, that intersection of vulnerability and policy and development rights that I think, again, sort of like, you know, they are workarounds and yet they're, you know, people are deeply resistant to this idea of like ceasing to develop in the floodplain or thinking like, okay, we have to old, hold that area in open space because it can actually be a buffer in the storms to come to help us provide protection for what's coming down the line. Another way we're seeing things get worse, um, you know, just from observation is that um, with local control and private property rights, um, you often get kind of a piecemeal whatever a property owner wants to do and certainly there's some regulatory damping of that but you know that's kind of viewed negatively in a, in a lot of the the circles and and so um what what has happened is people build um armoring and they think it's going to protect them 
what they don't understand is it's uh, as sea level rises or the coast of roads, the loadings are nonlinear. So if the sea level goes up one foot, the wave run up and overtopping goes up four or five feet, you know, and the rocks aren't big enough to hold, you know, the wall damage. And so, but in the meantime, before that all happens, um, the property values go up. And of course, everybody makes money on the transactions, people get elected, et cetera. And um, we're becoming more brittle. In other words, we're even less resilient because in effect, the rising property values increase our risk. And there, it, my concern is, or one of the things I'm concerned about is we may have essentially a market correction at some point when people realize that or the market realizes that coastal property perhaps isn't as valuable. I, I don't want people's values to go down, but if you look at it from a high altitude, you might expect that might happen at some point. I mean, it is, that is happening on the yeah. East Coast already. Yeah. It's happening in Norfolk, it's happening in Miami. Um, it's definitely happening you know, all up and down New England. Yeah, and increasingly yeah. insurance companies are looking at those kinds of risks, you know, when assessing, you know, homeowners policies and, and things like that, where it's, it's a little bit on the bleeding edge, but it's definitely a shifting situation. Well, and a lot of the priority development areas in San Francisco Bay apparently are fairly um, exposed to, because they are, you know, I guess less expensive, not fully developed, and so there are opportunities. But yeah, our planning, um, we don't really have long range planning that yet fully incorporates future conditions other than, you know, uh, expected population growth and increased tax revenues, you know, so we're still, the, the state of California is working really hard on this. And I think they're doing a great job, but, you know, it, it's just going to take a while for us to really figure out how to handle this um, sea level rise. It's a, it's a real challenge. Um, but anyway, so I'm sorry to be negative, but I really like the, um, the kind of motivated land use. And then I think we can look at it as an opportunity to redevelop and do things better. Um, and it does seem like one of the bigger challenges is how do we help those that perhaps don't really have the resources, you know, and, and as Elizabeth was saying, how do we avoid doing something that's counterproductive where people just can't afford to live somewhere where they have bought a house or they, you know, started their American dream type thing. So it does, the disadvantaged communities, I think, are a really important consideration. Yeah, <laughs> this has been a great conversation. I haven't had to do much as moderator, um, <laughs> just started the ball rolling, but it's so, I can see it's so complex with um, overlapping and intersecting points of view about what's best use for the land. And, you know, of course the desire, you know, the individual desire for profit and the rest of it makes it so much more complicated. But one, you know, so often we look to the government, you know, to like set the basis for laws of, about land use. And um, FEMA and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineer for, uh, Engineers, for example, have often been called into change shorelines or you know change drainage and all that kind of thing do you feel like they are adapting well in adjusting their recommendations to the greater rate of sea level rise bob would you say that you feel that what, what do you think they're how do you think they're doing yeah I, you know i think they are i mean the, the corps of engineers is a massive organization with a lot of capabilities and one of which is they're a conduit for federal funding mm -hmm. and everybody needs money um but they also have a lot of inertia and, it, and they have to do things a certain way. And um, so it kind of takes longer, maybe is expensive. I think that they are, they, they, they have uh, guidelines for sea level rise. Um, uh, they do consider sea level rise in their planning. Um, that's started since the uh, late eighties, I guess, is, is when that changed. So they've been doing that for a while. Unfortunately, their missions as directed by Congress are still kind of focused on protecting property, built assets, um, uh, and comparing the value of those assets to the cost of the protection. And it's still hard when you do an economic analysis to really account for the ecological values. 
and some of the other softer values, um, you know, equities, different types of equities, whatever. Um, they have, I think, progressed a lot in terms of as much as any organization in terms of valuing uh, restoration and habitat, both for its protective services, but also they do have a separate kind of non-monetary accounting. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, as an engineer, I want to be careful not to beat up on the core of engineers. They're big enough. They, they, they can handle it and they get blamed for things, but they also do a lot of good work and um, conduit for federal money. I think that, uh, as an engineer, I think we need more engineers that um, to help with this problem. I think you know California could use a couple more good engineers. Frankly, we don't really have a department of adaptation, and I think we should um, team with all the resources that we can. The um, group Charge is um, a local um, county flood control group um, that is actively pursuing uh, that type of thing in San Francisco Bay to kind of bring public works and engineering know-how into climate adaptation. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but. Can I, can I add one thing to, to Bob's comment on the core and Christine? Um, so something that's important to remember about the core is that, you know, they work with local partners. And so when we look, um, for example, at the South Bay Shoreline Protection Project, which has been a project years in the making, that's um, always been authorized as a multi-benefit project. And so the local partners there, um, uh, the Coastal Conservancy, um, Santa Clara Valley Water District, um, really worked with the Corps to develop collaboratively a multi-benefit project that not only protected low-lying areas of the bay, such as Alviso and the wastewater treatment plant from flooding, but partnered it with habitat restoration elements, including the restoration of salt ponds and the construction of that ecotone levy um, to provide habitat restoration benefits. Um, then, you know, you look at Marin County, what happened with the Corps and the Corte Madera Flood Control Project, that was not a multi-benefit authorization. Um, that project had a flood, had a single purpose flood control authorization, really dating back to the early 1900s, that really tied um, the county's hands when it came to demanding um, an ecologically beneficial project out of the core. And the core, you know, to their credit, really worked really hard with the county to come up with a, a multi-benefit strategy. But because they were operating under a single purpose flood control authorization, it made it really, it made it impossible for them to, um, from a cost benefit analysis, pay for the ecosystem, ecosystem restoration components of that project. And that's what led to the divorce between the county and, uh, not the only factor, but that was one of the factors that led to the divorce between the county and the core on that project so that the county could move forward with both flood control and ecosystem you know, restoration benefits. So when we're talking about the core, we also have to talk about you know, the, the local partners and the authorizations and the degree to which they can really collaborate um, it's it we can't just leave it up up to the core the motivation really has to come from from the local partners as well yeah I'd like to just add one thing quickly thinking about like to touch on sort of the FEMA edge of that question which is you know are they being productive proactive in thinking about sea level rise adaptation as something that needs to be addressed I know that this summer um, they just set aside more funding for their hazard mitigation grant program, which, you know, is the only national prop program that we have that funds managed retreat in the country that I know of. Um, and often when we see managed retreat happening, it's post storm and you have funding that is made available um, through a disaster declaration and goes into the hazard mitigation grant program is filtered through the hazard mitigation grant program and you get a local municipality that's interested in pursuing managed retreat as an adaptation strategy and usually there's some kind of matching that happens where the federal government gives 75 percent of the cost for retreat and the local government has to make available 25 percent of the cost Often, you know, if you have a resourceful floodplain manager in place, that person will think about how they can 
utilize some of the funds that have been made available through the disaster declaration to make to contribute their 25% local match. Um, so I think, you know, this is another aspect of both what Christine and Bob are talking about, which is um, there's also this level at which thinking about who's going to get, how do you even access funding for really interesting adaptation techniques on the ground, you need to have, you know, someone who is super resourceful and has a position that's sort of set aside for floodplain management that understands the ins and outs of this conversation that's going to be good at identifying ways in which your local municipality could potentially sort of we call it double dipping double dip um, use the money from the federal disaster declaration to put in your 25 percent match for the hazard mitigation grant program to get money to um, retreat and that's another thing that we you know think about in terms of equity and managed retreat is that you again have low these lower income lower resource communities that aren't going to have those civil servants on the ground who can make those connections um, and help them adapt in ways that are um, equitable and just for those on the ground so we also see if you sort of look at some of the very the only nationwide studies that we have of managed retreat, um, they started coming out, you know, a couple of years ago, and they start to show that it's interestingly often the lower income communities within a higher wealth bracket that have a floodplain manager on the ground. Those are the communities that we're seeing getting access to managed retreat. It's not necessarily um, low low income, and it's not necessarily you know rural um outside of urbanized areas that are getting access to this funding because they usually just don't have them the manpower on the ground to even you know check all the bureaucratic boxes well it. that's that actually brings up a great point i've been thinking about as i've been listening to you which is you know when you talked about the communities in staten island ocean beach that i think it's ocean beach that did manage to did a managed retreat but you also talked about other low-income areas on Staten Island that were heavily impacted by the storm. It sounds like what happens is that you need a community to have a certain level of affluence and influence in order to, to um, access this and do a managed retreat. What happens to the poorer communities, often you know, the communities where there's a higher minority population? What happened with them on uh, Staten Island? Can you tell us about that? I mean, so Staten Island, I would say <laughs> nine communities advocated to be bought out. Three were eventually bought out there. You know, when I contacted the governor's office of storm recovery to help uh, to sort of push that question, why some got bought out and some didn't, uh, the answer was pretty basic in terms of, you know, I was told they're basically, our pockets aren't bottomless. Um, and that they had to draw a line somewhere. And they were really looking for the communities that had the highest percentage of interest and sort of contin, I always forget if it's contiguous or continuous parcels. I think it's contiguous when they actually are physically touching. Yeah, it's probably um, continuous. <laughs> so they were looking at places where residents had, you know, there were high numbers of contiguous parcels because managed retreat also you know, for the city to be really interested in it, they're also going to be thinking about, okay, this means that we can cease, ideally cease to, you know, maintain high cost municipal services in these areas. We don't want to keep repairing the roads as they flood. We don't want to keep um, all the different infrastructure running. We don't want to keep running that bus out there. So they were also looking for places that had, you know, where they could buy a big chunk of properties and sort of take, move that land. Ideally, the idea was to move it into open space. And I know someone in one of the chats said, you know, who owns that land after it's been retreated from? That's a great question. It's completely up in the air and sort of depends on the project um, in its current, in our current state, you know, does the does the state own those parcels? They do for a certain amount of time. They're responsible for maintaining them. They've reseeded them with native grasses. 
Uh, they run a security guard out there. But I think in 2022, their ownership of that land ceases and they're hoping that someone else will buy it. Like they want to actually sell it to the core to integrate into um, the big berm that the Corps of Engineers is supposed to build along the eastern side of Staten Island. So there's this floating question around, you know, once we retreat, who owns it? I'm a big advocate of thinking about what if we had a 90,000 mile, you know, nationalized seashore? What does it mean to think about our coastline as something that we hold communally? Um, what are the values that we want to invest in this space as we move forward? Yeah. You know, that's a really interesting thought, Elizabeth. What if we got to a point where people could live on the coast, but they can't, um, necessarily hold on to a fixed piece of property. I mean, maybe they could, there's places people could live and they just have to recognize it's a floodplain and maybe there's a way that that could be done where it's um, enjoyable, you know, for, I don't know, financially it makes sense, but also enjoyable for them so that it is fair and equitable and everything. And um, yeah. I, it used to be, I think people had more of a feeling like that. They lived in a, on the coast that there might be a storm and there might be something to happen and, and they would rebuild or move if they had to. And I think people have moved. It's just in the last 50 plus years, all of a sudden we've come to this conclusion that we, once we build something, it cannot, I mean, some of these structures are, you know, less than a hundred years old, they're 50 years old. And for some reason, it's very hard for us to understand that they may not be there forever. Anyway, it's just an interesting cultural phenomenon, phenomenon we find ourselves in, uh, especially on the Pacific Coast, where people literally think that someone should come protect their property for them. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and at the same time, there's also this strong, but I'm totally independent and I don't need the government. But Meanwhile, <laughs> if the shore starts to retreat, I want them there to hold the line. It's, it's complicated. But so Elizabeth, back to my question to you, it sounded like, um, would you say overall that the communities that did not get bought out maybe suffered because they did not have strong community organization to like present a united front to, I, I'm about to, I, I need to transition to the last question, but I just wanted to ask you that quickly because I wanted to, try to close the loop and find out what was it about the communities that did not get bought out, whether you would say they lacked community organization to present United Front and so they all missed out on it, or would you say there might've been active discrimination on the part of the government or the city in you know, maybe not valuing those people as highly? I was gonna say, you know, when I think of what makes social vulnerability um, who's vulnerable on Staten Island, it's often white working class, and but you do have immigrant populations from Sri Lanka, from Colombia, from Russia, and I definitely saw sort of a sprinkling of all of those um, demographics in Oakwood Beach, the area that was bought out. If I look at you know the other areas that weren't bought out, I don't necessarily see a higher concentration of people of color, for instance. Um, I think, and you know, I, I would be reticent to say they lacked community organization. I would say the line between the most organized and the least organized is in Staten Island was not that big, but it was probably enough to distinguish one from the other. Mm -hmm. Oakwood Beach was really the first community. And then Ocean Breeze was second. So the two that's really started the grassroots buyout campaign and had the most interest going into their petition to the state government were two that were bought out. Then you had the third Ocean Breeze that was small and had a lot of those contiguous parcels. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So I wouldn't say in this Staten Island case that there is active discrimination. I think that there is definitely at a national level, structural discrimination against communities of color and lower, lower, lower income communities around this managed retreat question, but not, I didn't necessarily be not in, that instance. in Staten Island. Yeah. Well, that's great to know. Okay. So I'm looking at the clock. This has been 
so amazing. All three of you have just been an incredible group to, to work with and I've learned so much. I always like to wrap up with a similar question, which is because I think that, you know, we're training people to be advocates here to speak up for the issues that they're facing and, and ones in the larger community. And it's hard work. Climate change is hard work because, you know, none of this is going to like solve it. It's not going to happen quickly. It's not going to happen easily. And we're just hoping it happens in some form at all. So I like to always ask people, what is it that keeps you going? What personal practices or beliefs or perspectives or facts keep you charged up and engaged in climate action, despite the enormity of the challenges in this case of sea level rise? So maybe Elizabeth, you could go first. <laughs> sure. Um... I, I think I have two answers to that question. One is that I find, you know, it's just really important for me to be active in my body to keep hiking and running and biking. Um, and I think that certainly that's something that unfortunately is like easy to lose track of that all of these things that we're working on behalf of in the more than human world um, are can also be like deep sources of regenerative energy. And it's important to sort of tap into that. I think Christina and Bob, both of your presentations in different ways reminded me of that with the Bayshore um, bike pathway and Bob's often references to surfing. It's like, these are things that we actually, that are actually really deep wells of inspiration that replenish us. Um, the other thing that I would say is, in the 10 years that I've been working on this issue, I've seen our interest in it grow exponentially. And especially among younger generations, you know, watching and participating in, you know, the sunrise movement and these really awesome radical activist movements that are demanding sort of that we consider justice and equity as we start to challenge, you know, address the climate crisis. Those are huge sources of inspiration for me because that certainly wasn't the case ten years ago. Yeah, yeah, that is an inspiring, inspiring point. Christina, what would you like to add? What, 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 what keeps me going? going? What keeps you going? The climate crisis. Uh, we have no choice. <laughs> <laughs> Frankly, you know, um, nature. <laughs> Nature bats last, and um, uh, if there's something that I can do to, climate change is gonna create a lot of suffering, um, and uh, it's gonna displace a lot of people, it's gonna hurt a lot of people, um, it's going to um, trigger tremendous changes in our understanding of society and how we relate to each other and how we live, and um, uh, I want to help people. You know, it used to be when I first got involved in this work, it was really about making sure that um, that uh, animals had places to live because I had given up on humans. <laughs> and as I've gotten older, I've gotten strangely less misanthropic um, and, you know, I've recognized more that, um, you know, it's, it's really about helping to prevent uh, and ameliorate suffering. And so I, frankly, I, it, for me, it's very much a, a, a moral, ethical um, need for me to address. So, and selfishly, I just really like beaches and I'd like for them to still be there, you know, when I'm old and for my daughter, everyone's mm -hmm. like, oh, now that you're a mom, you must want to do everything for your kid. Yeah, my kid's great. I want beaches when I'm old. Mm -hmm. So I want there to be marshes. I want there to be beaches. So. Thank you so much. And, and I'm glad you decided not to give up on humanity. I appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> and uh, Bob, what would you like to say? Well, I, similar to what Christina says, I, I, you have to get some perspective after a while, you know, after you get beat up in a public meeting or something and you realize that it's kind of, you reflect, eventually all this work we're doing will be very useful to, to folks when they decide that they want to do something. And so I try to keep that perspective you know, as a surfer, you know, especially surfing out at Ocean Beach in San Francisco, which is uh, kind of rough, you know, sometimes you just have to keep paddling out. You get run over by waves and you keep going until, you know, eventually you get out there and you get a good ride and you just, uh, this is part of the, part of the process. Um, 
yeah, so I just keep that perspective and recognize whether people realize it now or not. Eventually, I think what I'm doing is helpful, will be helpful. Well, thank you so much for that. You guys have just been the most amazing group.